Hi, Dave. Welcome to Western Hills. Thomas here. Today we're going to be in the book of Mark, chapter 16. Last time we met, we went through chapter 15 with the account of Jesus' trial, resurrection, and death. And today, Mark 16 is the resurrection. Verse 1 reads, Now when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Salome, bought spices that they might come and anoint him. So setting the stage a little bit here. This is after the resurrection or, or Sabbath passed sometime after 6 p.m. on Saturday. And do you remember Salome? It was Salome that brought her two sons to Jesus and asked that they might sit on both sides of Christ in his kingdom. So here we have uh, Salome and both Marys bringing spices to to anoint Jesus. Stop and think here for a moment. They're bringing spices to anoint Jesus. Will he be there? Of course not. Jesus had foretold all things that would happen to his disciples, so he's not going to be there. So why do we know that his body will not be anointed? Because his body was already anointed. Recall back in Mark, uh, Mark 14, 3, the woman that brought her expensive box of ointment of spikenard? Yeah, she anointed his body there. This is why we should always remember her always, for she did the anointing for this burial and resurrection. Now, I'm not sure why Mary, these two Marys and Salome brought spices to anoint Jesus' body. Maybe they simply didn't believe Meta's words that, that he would not be there. Uh, verse 2. Very early in the morning on the first day of the week, they came to the tomb when the sun had risen. These three ladies, they arrived at the tomb right as the sun was coming up. But by this time, all that remained was an empty tomb. Verse 3. And they said among themselves, Who will roll away the stone from the door of the tomb for us? On their way to the tomb, the thing that bothered them was how they were going to get that huge stone moved away from the door of the sepulcher. It was obvious that these women would be unable to move it. The mention of the soldiers guarding the stone does not come up here as they didn't know anything about that. Their concern was simply moving that huge stone. And once a stone is moved in place, it's, it's hard to move. Uh, it sets in the ground and it develops a rut. So this would have been a very difficult rock to move. Verse 4. But when they looked up, they saw that the stone had been rolled away for it was very large. The account of Mark here does not tell us how the stone was moved. All Mark tells us is that the stone was very large. Verse 5. In entering the tomb, they saw a young man clothed in a long white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. The right side is always the side of honor. They were amazed to see this man sitting on the right side there in his long white garment. And although Mark doesn't spell it out, this man before them was an angel. And angels are always described as young because they are in their spiritual bodies and there, there's no aging process to their existence. Think about it. There's no, there's no age in the eternal spiritual life. And these, these women, they're alarmed. I think we all would be in, in given that situation. Verse 6. But he said to them, Do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. The woman's fright was calmed by the words of reassurance, don't be alarmed. 
This angel knows why they have come to the tomb, and he tells them, Don't be afraid. Ye seek Jesus of Nazareth, which was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. In the Greek text, it reads, Ye seek the Savior of God, the Nazarite crucified. It is very emphatic as it reads here. Well, the, the, the angel shows these lazy ladies the fine linen that was placed around Jesus at his burial, and it's still in the same place where they laid him. Jesus was resurrected. But go tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you into Galilee. There you will see him as he said to you. Now this verse warms my heart. He says, go tell his disciples and Peter. We see how gracious the provision God made for Peter's special need through the word of the angel. Peter singled out, singled out because he had denied Jesus and now Peter needed, needed reassurance that he was not excluded from the company of the disciples. Jesus had forgiven him and restored him. As well, we find the angel confirming exactly what Jesus told him would happen, that he would return to Galilee, fulfilling his promise. It's, fit, it's fitting that they meet up here because it was there that he told them that he would make them fishers of men. Verse 8. So they went out quickly and fled the tomb, for they trembled and were amazed. They said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. The confrontation with the angel proved to be too much for the women. They fled, trembled, and were bewildered. I think this would be a natural reaction. Now Mark is the only book that tells us that they said nothing to anyone. Most likely meaning they were so frightened and confused that they were silent at first, and after collecting their wits about them, they did a lot of talking. A little bit about verse 8 here. Um, some believe that the book of Mark ends with verse 8, as there is some disparity between the early manuscripts. However, the thought is not complete, for there is much more that happened as we will read. Even though there's some thought as rather or not the last 12 verses belong in Mark, the earliest authorities of Scripture knew of these 12 verses and regarded them very highly. So with that, let's go on to verse 9. Now when he rose early on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had cast seven demons. Mary Magdalene's life must have really changed from a life filled with seven devils to one possessed by the Holy Spirit of God. Think about this. Mary Magdalene was the first person to witness the risen Christ. A bit of a side note here. Mary Magdalene is mentioned for the fourth time in this gospel. He had strange that the detail out of whom he had cast seven demons is for the first time mentioned here. Verse 10. She went out and told those that had been with him as they mourned and wept. Yeah, Mary, Mary, she carried out the command of the angel given her back in verse 7. She found the disciples. And they were in the state of mourning. Now we have to think about this. People in Jerusalem, they were celebrating the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread, yet the disciples were weeping. But they won't be weeping for long, verse 11. And when they had heard that he was alive and had been seen by her, they did not believe. Mary's witness to them that Jesus was alive and 
She knew it because she had seen him. The reluctance of the disciples to believe her, it's certainly, understandably, a resurrection is no ordinary event. In the book of Luke 24, 10 and 11, we read that Mary Magdalene and Joanna and the mother, Mary, the mother of Jesus and other women that were with them, which told these things unto the apostles. And in verse 11, the words seemed to them as idle tales, and they believed them not. I ponder this. The first preachers to bring the gospel to us men were women, even from the resurrection, and the men simply would not believe them. It says that the men thought they were idle tales. Now, in today's age, there's always discussion as to whether women should or should not be in the pulpit. I have mixed feelings. I do believe that women are more sensitive to God's spirit than men. At one time, I used to believe that women could be deceived easier than men, but I'm not sure of that anymore. But what I do know, that in the last days, Scripture tells us in Acts 2.17 that God will pour out His Spirit upon all flesh, and that their sons and daughters shall prophesy. Verse 12. After that, he appeared in another form to two of them as they walked and went into the country, and they went and told it to the rest, but they did not believe them either. These two verses in Mark are shortened, or a shortened account of the story of the two men on the way to Emmaus, uh, found in Luke 24, 13 through 35. Uh, let's, let's read that. I want to take a second and read Luke 24, 13 through 35. Now the same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them. But they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, What are you discussing together as you walk along? And they stood still their faces downcast. One of them, called Cleopas, asked him, Are you only a visitor to Jerusalem and do not know the things that have happened there in these days? What things, he asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of the women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but they didn't find a body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it, just as the woman had said but him they did not see. He said to them, How foolish you are, and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Christ have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. As he approached the village to which, were which they were going, Jesus acted as if they were going farther. But they urged him strongly, Stay with us, for it's nearly evening and the day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they recognized him, and he disappeared from their sight. And they asked each other, were not our hearts burning with, within us while we talked with us? Well, he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us. They got up and returned at once to Jerusalem, 
There they found the eleven and those with them assembled together and saying, It is true, the Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. Then the two that had, hap that had happened on the way and how Jesus had, was recognized by them when he broke the bread. Mark adds nothing to the story found in Luke other than the statement that they did not believe them either. Just as these two men were blinded to who Jesus was, they, did, they simply did not believe that Jesus had risen. So also the disciples were also blinded to this same disbelief. In that three-day time that Jesus was away from his followers, the whole group just fell apart in disbelief. Even his disciples, his apostles, disbelieved. So here's a question. Why were the apostles last to see Christ? Could it be that they were allowed to hear of the resurrection before seeing the risen Christ in order that they might know from personal experience what it is to have to depend upon testimony of others, as would be the case with their converts? Um, moving on, verse 14. Later he appeared to the eleven as they sat at the table. He rebuked their unbelief, hardness of heart, because they did not believe those who had seen him after he had risen. As the disciples were together arguing in a disbelief, Jesus appeared to his disciples and he scolded them for his unbelief. They rebuked that Jesus gave his disciples is particularly severe, more severe, in fact, than any other rebuke he gives them elsewhere in the Gospels. I'm, I'm sure that each of the disciples stood there and took Jesus' words humbly as they finally realized exactly who Jesus was. But can't you just see Jesus standing before these men, reminding them of each time he had told them of his suffering, death, and resurrection? Verse 15. And he said to them, Go into the world and preach the gospel to every creature. So the great commission given here, the gospel of Jesus Christ, his death, burial, and resurrection, is to be preached to every one of God's creations. Jews, Gentiles alike. Recall that it was contrary to the opinions of the Jews that Gentiles should be admitted to the privileges of the Messiah's kingdom or, or the partition between them should be broken down. But there is no difference between Jew or Gentile. We are all the same in Jesus Christ. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. Belief and baptism are so closely associated that they are thought of as a single act or witness to that faith. In other words, faith is belief and the act of baptism is the witness of that faith. It, it doesn't say that if you're not baptized, you'll not be saved. Refusal to believe results in judgment. I think the thought here is that baptism is important as, our, as it is our testimony of our belief that Jesus died for our sins. Baptism is indeed a symbol of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Verse 17. And these signs will follow those who believe. In my name they'll cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. The signs are those things that make it obvious that the Holy Spirit is within that individual. You either have Christ in you or you don't. If you have Christ in you, then his Spirit, the Holy Spirit, is there also. It's just that simple. There are so many finds that follow us when we believe in Jesus Christ. God has given us many natural abilities, and when we use those for his name, that is a sign of those who believe. What is this? What does this speak with new tongues about? Well, it's not an unknown tongue as many teach. It's not some 
secret language. Rather, it's a, a new language, teaching and preaching so that you will say will be understood. If you take the truth to the entire world, you would need to learn the language with understanding of the country that you will teach in, or they will simply not understand you. The disciples and those that are going out to teach the gospel are going to have to learn those languages, or they're going to have to take an interpreter with them. If people don't understand what you're saying, they won't even know when to say amen. Verse 18. They will take up serpents, and if they drink anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick, and they will recover. Boy, is this verse taken out of context so often. We've all seen the snake handlers of the Appalachia, and, and many of those have died handling snakes. We can remember, this verse is spiritually speaking. Who is that serpent? Satan is the serpent. Uh, Revelation 12, 9 tells us so. Satan is afraid of the power with, within us. If you take these words literally and go out into the woods and pick up a live rattlesnake, I guarantee you that old rattler doesn't know that he's afraid of you and he's going to bite you. That old rattler doesn't know whether you have faith or not and he could care less what you believe or not. And it says, if they drink anything deadly. Jesus is not telling anyone to drink poison. This, again, is a figure of speech referring to malicious gossip. It is taking a part truth and changing it to destroy someone or something. It's taking a truth and twisting and turning it into a lie. Jesus is saying that there will be those that will allow Satan to twist their minds to try to destroy you. But you don't have to allow that to happen. Poison and filth that people will use against you will not harm you when you're in the will of God. We are to live our lives so that our character will be such that it doesn't matter what people say about us. For our character will stand the test. A true Christian's character will stand all the tests of the lies and gossip spreaders can spread about you. That's what it is talking about. That's the poison that is meant here. Poison, the lies and gossip will run right off you like water off a duck's back. Verse 19. So then after the Lord had spoken to them, he was received up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. We know from Acts 1, 7 through 9, where this took place. We know that this is where Jesus will be at the right hand of the Father as our advocate until this earth age is finished. And he said unto them, It is not known for you to know the times of the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power, but you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost, is come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and all Judea, and in Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up in a cloud, received him out of their sight. That was Acts 1, 7 through 9. Okay, back to Mark, verse 20 reads, And they went out and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word through their accompanying signs. Amen. And, and these guys, these apostles, they did go everywhere. Jesus' disciples fanned out over the world from India and the east to Africa and parts of the north. This ministering uh, is very well known as recorded through many historical records. When you preach the word of God to, to reach sinners, then you have to go where the sinners are. What are you going to preach? Let the Lord working with them. This working is what we've just finished in this entire book of Mark. 
It also includes the rest of the New Testament and all the Old Testament, and it includes all the promises that God had made to those that by faith repent and believe on his name. It says here, confirming the word. Confirming in the Greek text is bebio, or to establish, to make sure, steadfast, to give stability. All the signs and prophecies that our Lord Jesus Christ gave that are written in his word gives us guideposts to, to place in our mind. The Holy Spirit will give us understanding of those things just that Jesus taught. And in this, in this, and in this final generation, we are to be on watch for those signs of the end times, of the generation that we're now living, so that we're not deceived. Amen and amen.